In the previous videos where I've talked about the WWE's lack of a franchise player as a major problem and how John Cena was a prop and not a franchise player, one of the byproduct conversations that kind of arose out of it was whether or not a woman could be the WWE's next franchise player. And it's interesting to think about, especially off the heel of the women's revolution and the increased emphasis on both the Raw and SmackDown properties of women in the programming. You have a high-ranking woman executive in Stephanie McMahon, the boss's daughter. So there is a thought that as her influence in the company is at a certain level that it wouldn't be a surprise someday that you could successfully have a woman be a face of the franchise or the face of the franchise and you've seen other places where this has been done where they've tried to make a woman uh, be the face of the place and it's worked to certain degrees you think of ufc and ronda rousey as one example of where they took a woman and out of circumstances and what the reality was they made her into the biggest attraction for ufc for a period of time and, and it, it kind of worked um but and people will sit there and bring up the examples of the Chinas, the Sables, the Trishes, the Litas, and so on and so forth, and how they became big time massive stars, in lesser degrees, the Stacey Keeblers, the Tori Wilsons, and da 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 da. And there's no denying their star power or how they got over in the business or money made off of them in the business or money they made in the business, that's true. But being a star and being a franchise player are two entirely different things. Mick Foley was a star, a big star, but he wasn't your franchise guy. In that time frame, it was Austin, Rock, and especially Vince. Those are your franchise guys. Like, you even had big megastars like the Ultimate Warrior and Macho Man, and even if you tried to make them into the one true franchise player, ultimately Hulk was the one true franchise player. It's just the way that it is. You could be a star, you could be a big-time star. It doesn't mean you're the face that runs the place, so to speak. And I think this is a big problem for WWE, and it's something they've lacked for a long period of time. So when looking for it and talking about what I think is the challenge of finding that next person, because, again, Roman is not that guy. To me, he's just another prop similar to what Cena and Orton were for a decade or so. I'm not surprised that some people think that a woman could potentially be that person. I understand it, and I get it, and I think people are completely and totally wrong about this. I think there is no way in hell the WWE could have a woman be their franchise player and it be an incredible success. And before you just label me as some woman-hating, sexist, chauvinist pig, which you probably will anyways, and that's fine, hear me out. There are a few reasons why I believe that a woman could not be the franchise player for the WWE and that be a good thing for the WWE. Number one, and perhaps first and foremost, a company that still to this day is run by Vince McMahon in the way that we know he views women and for so many years viewed women's wrestling. You think all of a sudden now that he would go from that place to the complete polar opposite in his 70s by saying not only can women do it as good as the boys, they can maybe do it better, and I'm going to put the entire load of the company on that lady's shoulders. Are you high? Are you completely and totally insane? Because to me, you would have to be to think that in any way, shape, or form, that's a reality. And even if you want to believe that Stephanie McMahon has all this power and influence over the company, with that being said, she's had that power and influence over the company for over a decade now. And look until the past couple of years how women were largely treated by the WWE. They weren't treated as serious wrestlers. They weren't even treated as good eye candy. They were treated as fill-in crap. And that's with Stephanie instituting her way of doing things over the creative process. So you think all of a sudden that's just magically going to change and that's magically going to get better? I think you're crazy. Absolutely crazy to think that all of a sudden there's going to be some magical change. Because there's not going to be a change in the philosophy. And ultimately, if there's not a change in that philosophy, 
it's not going to work because as we've seen before, it doesn't matter what the audience tells the WWE. It doesn't matter what the audience wants from WWE. The WWE has to be convinced themselves by themselves that this is the right way to go in order for you to get it, whether you want it or not. It doesn't matter. If they don't think it's right, it's not going to happen. And I just cannot see how anybody in the powers that be that really matter in WWE think that that's going to be the right way to go. Number two, when you think about women and building an entire foundation around them, you have to look at a lot of these women that we've had and say, even if you point to the Chinas and the Sables and the Trishes and the Litas and so on and so forth, they haven't been around very long. Like China was hot. She was a mega star and she was there all of what, like four years? Trish, what, six years, maybe seven? Lita, a little bit longer, but not too much longer. So you look at it and you say, Sable, how long was she with the company? I understand different circumstances, but the point I'm getting to is, is a lot of times when this company gets behind women, they only stick around for a certain period of time. Like the most notable recent example of trying to make ladies the face of your women's divas division was the Bellas. And now they're off doing their reality shows. They're doing this, they're doing that, and pretty much everything other than actually being about professional wrestling. And oftentimes a lot of these women get into the business as a path as a step in the journey, not the ultimate destination. It's very important to understand that. For some, that's not the case. For a lot of them, it is. And oftentimes, after a certain period of time, they get tired of that time on the road. They get tired of the travel. They get tired of this. They get tired of that. And they frankly think that they're bigger stars and more over than they are. And they decide they're going to go off and do other things. Number three doesn't even factor in that a lot of these women, after a certain period of time, it could be tough to rely upon them, especially if you're talking about building an entire company around them, knowing that you're going to need them to do all these appearances and most importantly, have the ability of availability consistently when so many of these ladies over the years have left after a certain period of time because they get married, they want to start a family, they have kids and skip de skip and whoop de woo Imagine being a company and you sit there and... You go into this thinking, we're going to have this lady for eight to 10 years. She has everything. She could be this big time mega star. And then she gets pregnant. I got to think of the karma stuff. Also Kong. You know, not saying that she was going to be the franchise player, but the company brought her in thinking it was going to be this, thinking she were going to do that with her. And almost instantly she's pregnant. There's that risk of pregnancy. And I know it's a terrible way to say it, but from a business standpoint, it's not always about our sensibilities and people's feelings. It is about money. It's about business. And there's shareholders to protect. There's a board of directors to answer to. There are employees to protect and all of that. So if you sit there and you get behind this lady and you put her on this big mega push and all of a sudden she gets pregnant she's potentially out of commission for at least a year if she ever comes back at all. That's a huge risk for a company to take. And there is nothing wrong with these ladies getting into the business, doing their thing for a time, and then deciding that they want something more, they want to do something different, they fall in love, they get married, they have kids, they start a family, and they want to be there for their kids, their family. That's great, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that except from the standpoint of a business. If you're going to make these ladies your franchise players, they need to be there for an extended period of time. And there is a fundamental risk associated, sorry whether you like it or not, that one of these ladies could get pregnant and then they're out for a year and then you don't know if or when they're ever going to come back. So why would you invest all of this out of them to one day just be able to sit there and say, I'm not going to get anything more out of them. Not to mention the history of some of the ladies that you've had. Like even recently, like some of y'all clowns would have made AJ Lee or Paige your franchise player. Where the hell are they now? AJ Lee fell in love and she ultimately left the company because she didn't want to do it anymore. And now didn't she get pregnant and have a kid with Punk? Paige, we know what Paige has been doing. But again, when you're talking about a franchise player, the WWE to me should be modeling themselves more like a professional football team as opposed to a college football team. And in a lot of cases, if you were going to take a woman and make her the face that ran the place, the franchise player, 
you're looking at running more of a college type team where every three to four years you're having to find a new star. You're having to find somebody else. Whereas a professional team, you want to find that franchise quarterback, that franchise player, and keep him in the fold for 10 to 15 years. So when you look back at Cena and Orton, it made a lot of sense for the WWE to use them as props. They weren't franchise players, but they were props because there was a large feeling that those guys weren't going anywhere for at least a decade. So it made a lot of sense to invest a lot of resources in them because you felt like you would get the maximum ROI, return on investment, for all those resources you poured into them. That makes sense. But even like these biggest stars in terms of the ladies, they've only been around a certain period of time, which limits the amount of return on that initial and long-term investment that you get out of them. And then there's the fear, if you make them the franchise player, especially because they are a woman, how quickly is Hollywood going to come after them? Modeling agencies, uh, TV world, all of these different places. How long are you actually going to have that woman if you make them the top person? And I know this comes across as sexist and chauvinist and male piggish, and I don't care. Because again, speaking from a business standpoint, it does not make a whole lot of sense because you worry about how long you're going to have that woman there for a variety of reasons. And when you've got so many things at play and so many things at stake, you can't just take wild chances like that. And even when you look at the UFC, they sat there and did everything they could to make Ronda Rousey their big defendable franchise can't miss person. But as soon as she ran up against some women that could fight, she got her ass kicked. And now guess where she is? She's not there anymore. So when you use Ronda Rousey being the top person in UFC as your impetus to sit there and create this divas revolution, this women's revolution, to use it as an excuse to more prominently and appropriately feature your ladies, you also have to look at the byproduct that came as a result of that is eventually Rousey got her ass whooped, didn't want to do it anymore, and she hasn't done it since, and it left the UFC in a very bad place. They're lucky they had somebody like a Conor McGregor because where the hell would they be if they didn't? Long term, it didn't work for the UFC. And I know some of you are going to point to somebody like, I, I, in terms of the current rods, what are you going to build around a Charlotte Flair? You know, the challenge for having a woman be that franchise player, like it or not, is a lot of guys still to this day, in terms of wrestling fans, don't take women's wrestling all that seriously, no matter how much they might tr pretend to. Some of the hardcore hardcores do, but a lot of the other casual mainstream and even some of the hardcore male fans just don't take women's wrestling that seriously and never are going to because we've been programmed so many years not to. So we can't sit there and look at a Charlotte Flair and think that that's going to be the franchise. And I'm not just picking on Charlotte because I could plug in a lot of other women and say the same thing. She's not going to look good enough for long enough. She's not interesting enough. She's not compelling enough to build your entire company around. The closest you might come that would check off a majority of those boxes might be an Alexa Bliss. I will give her that. But the danger is with somebody like an Alexa Bliss is how long could you put the weight of not just a women's division, but an entire company on her back before she would decide she didn't want to do it anymore, or she finds somebody and she falls in love, she wants to get married, she wants to have kids, she wants to start a family, or Hollywood comes calling, the modeling world comes calling, this calls, TV calls, everything else calls. Oh, that's great. You built up Alexa Bliss and made her your top person, and a year and a half later, she's gone for one reason or another. I mean, these are legit concerns. And as nice you want it to be in an equality-based world that a woman could be the face of the WWE, the simple fact of the matter is, is I think it would be a business disaster if they are. Call me sexist, call me chauvinist, call me a pig, I don't care. Because the history is there to indicate that when the company a lot of times really starts to dive into these women, bad words, but they really trust these women and really invest in these women, that as soon as they do, these women use this as a springboard and a platform to go do other things and go other places. That's not a very good way to protect your franchise. So while it seems nice in theory, and before you sit there and say Asuka, again, it comes down to the age thing in this particular case. You're going to make her your franchise player when she's already in her mid-30s, been doing it for years. How long are you going to have her before she no longer does it? And is she really the type of person that you want to build an entire international wrestling sports entertainment company around? I don't think so. 
Not only do I not think that there's a woman capable of it now, I just don't think it's good in general because wrestling still always has been and always will be a man's world. And most importantly of all, in spite of all the history that suggests there would be some concerns about putting that much into a female talent, knowing how many different reasons they could potentially leave, the WWE just wouldn't buy into it, just wouldn't commit to it. And at the end of the day, that's all that matters. So no, a woman could never be WWE's franchise player.